fundamental truths about what you need as a car company to succeed. And I mentioned design, uh, quality. Because, yeah, quality is the price of doing business in the business now. Right. But that means you can't have anything go wrong. Because that's one place where the social media will bite your ass. Because, uh, you know, if some some woman has a bad experience in your service department, she can tweet or Facebook it on her way out the door and 500 people will know about it right away. Right. Um, and the third thing was, you know, fun to drive and, and really getting at, you know, because I don't think the, the car companies have addressed the youth market. You know, we've all been to these previews that, oh, this is aimed at a younger demographic. Younger demographic can't afford the car. That's right. Okay, and then you deep dive with these sales guys and they say, well, yeah, actually our used cars are entry level. And I'm saying the reason people are worried about kids not wanting to have their license, the car companies haven't given them a reason to get one. I mean, all the kids playing video games, racing games, you can't tell me that they wouldn't spark to something if it was presented to them. Mm -hmm. That's why I want an American car company to come out with a car that no adult would be caught dead in, that was 10 grand all in. Uh, I don't know, there's got to be a way for, there's a lot of smart people in this business, there's got to be, I don't care, you know, reverse the process of knockdown kits. You know how they send mm -hmm. knockdown yeah, kits? Right. Assemble it like a knockdown kit. Mm -hmm. Do the reverse of that. And come up with some funky little vehicle that's safe enough and everything, um, but like I say, no adult would be caught dead in. Because mm -hmm. there's that old ad you can sell a, young person's car to an old person, but you can't sell an old person's car to a young person. Well, make this car that, you know, we don't want to go near with, but it gives them mobility because I think the freedom of mobility is still one of the most powerful things in the human. And I totally agree. That's so, what makes this industry rock. Yeah. So that Ten, was my good. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Chevrolet, the all new Chevrolet Cruze, get used to more. And by Hyundai, experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. Well, thanks everybody for joining us and by us what I mean of course is me and the auto extremist Peter DeLorenzo here in the studio with me. Peter always good to be here with you. Great to be here John on the pre indie auto line after hours. Yeah we have to explain to everybody Peter's going to be here for the first part of the show but then he's going to have to leave because he's heading to the Indy 500. Mm. We'll later be joined with uh, Russ Clark who's the head of product marketing at Chevrolet. We really want to ask him about this new Malibu that they're coming out with that they've teased a little bit and uh, and Todd Lassa from Motor Trend magazine yeah. too and they'll join us here in the studio in just a little while but yeah, Indianapolis 500, the 100th anniversary. 100th anniversary of the race. That's an awesome statistic. I yeah. mean, no other race in the world comes close to that, does it? I don't think so. Now, it's not the 100th running of the race because of the gaps in the war years. Mm -hmm. But still, it's, it's huge it's that bad, yeah. they've been racing there for 100 years at that speedway. And, you know, it almost fell into, it did fall into disrepair. It almost... You know, we wouldn't be talking about it today if, if uh, uh, the Tony Holman, Tony Holman but I'm trying to remember who talked him into buying. Was it Wilbur Shaw or, I don't know, because Eddie Rickenbacker was involved, but oh. Tony Holman rescued the Speedway after Which the, was just falling apart, we, weeds growing up on yeah, the track. Yeah, I mean, after World War II, it was really sad, and, you know, he basically just spending all his own money once he bought it to uh, grow it and and here we are. It's one of the preeminent facilities in the world, really racing facilities in the world. I think it is, you know, it's the cathedral to speed. It is the, you know, you have the Nürburgring. Uh -huh. uh, the old track. The old track and you have Indy, but it's certainly, it's the, 
most compelling and historic facility you can visit if you're a race fan, right. I think. And Monaco, of course, has been around a whole long time, yeah. since the 20s, and of course they're running this weekend too. Yeah, so if there were four big races that we, as enthusiasts, talk about, it's, it's Le Mans, right. Monaco, Indy, and I guess you'd have to say the Daytona 500. I would say five, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Those four major races, if you're a young driver, that would be, you'd want to win one of those before you hang it up. So what do you make about this year's uh, race? I mean, the dominant teams, uh, Penske is like, they're, I, I'm not going to say on the trailer, because they're never on the trailer. And then Ganassi blows it completely. Both his cars run out of fuel just trying to qualify. Oh, man, that was stunning. Well, here's, here's one thing about this year's race that makes it interesting. This is the last year for the Dallara in its current form. Now, remember, this chassis's been around a while. Next year, they go to the new chassis. So this is kind of like the perfect storm where if you've been around the racing game and the IndyCar racing game for a while, you can... You know, you can muster, you can roll out a car that will qualify very well. And then um, you saw some things happen. Ryan Briscoe hit the wall on Saturday before qualifying. He had to go to his backup car. Now he's uh, in the ninth row. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ninth row of three row apiece, or yeah. three per row. Eleven rows of three. And Alio Castro Neves ended up in the sixth row, which was shocking. Now, Will Power came through and qualified in the middle of the second row. But, the Which is, but that's only almost barely acceptable. Yeah. Especially for a guy who's dominated the whole season. It was so the far. first time in, in I don't know how many years that a Penske car hasn't been on the front row. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the Ganassi thing was just, I mean, they clearly admit they, they made a mistake. I mean, Dario, it wasn't a pole run, but it was clearly going to be in the first two rows. And he literally runs out of gas, uh, fuel on his, uh, you know, in the th on the fourth lap or the right. end of the third or whatever. I was I was stunned. I was stunned too. Was just and then um, his teammate Scott Dixon said his car started to run out in four, and now he might have been on the pole. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was they were embarrassed and you know, but we have some great stories. We have. Alex Tagliani, who, uh, you know, he started put, his own team. Well, yeah, it's an adjunct of Sam Schmidt Motorsports. Now, Sam Schmidt was a, a journeyman IndyCar driver who was uh, had a horrible accident in practice 10 years ago, and he's, he's paralyzed now. But, you know, Sam is a great guy and has a great, retained his spirit, and it was great to see. Retained and, his spirit, you say, because he's confined to a wheel. Yeah, he, he kept his spirit, and he is a good guy, and uh, everyone was happy to see mm -hmm. uh, his affiliation uh, with Tagliani, and they got on the pole. Yeah. Uh, and then Oriel Servio is another story in, in the third position, and Townsend Bell. And Dan Weldon comes back and, and gets on the second row. Um, so that part of the race is one thing. You have these, the end of this, the life cycle of these chassis. You've got a bunch of people who can muster qualifying runs, but the race is a whole nother deal. Um, you know, you have you know, a few rookies in here, but you have people like Ryan Briscoe and Marco Andretti and Graham Rahal and Danica Patrick all in the last three rows. And, uh, you know, the start of the Indy 500 is the most electrifying moment in all of sport, period. It's also the most dangerous moment in all of sport because if you've ever been in Speedway and, you know, I highly recommend, if you've never been, to go ahead and take the bus tour because that'll be the only way you'll physically get on the track. And once you get on the track, you are stunned at what you see because uh, all you can think about is, really? You go 232 into turn one and turn into turn one at 232. and it's. Even We're when, talking miles an hour, not kilometers. Yeah, and you, even if you're, when you're riding in that bus, you're just like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And then they put three, three in a row for the start. It's, 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 it's tough. Um, 
What, what do you go back to what you were saying? Because I find this fascinating that these much smaller teams with much fewer resources have the dominant teams, which are Penske, Ganassi, and yeah. and Giretti Motorsport. First time it's happened in years. And so why is it that these little teams can somehow find? What it ever takes to tweak these cars to go real fast, and Andretti's teams—they're all on the back row practice. Well, they have, yeah. Andretti had back a horrible. Rows. They had a horrible uh, Indy qualifying. Uh, well, they accumulate. And of course, there's a history of that at Indy too. Yeah, they accumulate knowledge. Uh, they all have the same engine. You know, the engines are you know, right out of the, real, the Honda yeah, crate. Yeah, real close. Uh, if they have enough savvy people on their teams and they can get the setup just right and, you know, they can do it. I mean, it's an art, but again, qualifying at Indy and racing at Indy are two, two different, different things. As Rick Mears famously said, and I, I don't know if I got the miles right, but he's, I think he said, I spend the first 400 miles setting up my car for the last 100. Hmm. It was something like that. I, I might get there, but Rick, who I consider the greatest oval racer in history, uh, I mean, AJ's great, Allen's is great, but I thought Rick, uh, six poles at Indy, and he almost won five times. He, he, Rick should have been the only five-time winner. I thought he was the greatest oval racer, but that's what he said. You spend the whole race getting ready for the last 100 miles. And, uh, you know, a lot of these racers don't, you know, they're not familiar with that. There are plenty of veterans here, but qualifying is one thing. You know, running 200 laps, running in traffic, making pit stops, you have so many chances to make a mistake. And not only that, but this year uh, on the restarts after the yellows, it's going to be two abreast. Yeah. And they've you, never done an Indy. Yeah, and, I, and boy, the drivers are not happy. And that's still being discussed, from what I understand, down there. They might, I don't know what they're going to do, but uh, a lot of the veteran drivers says that's just a recipe for disaster at Indy. Because and, for anybody who's not, on, not familiar with it, they usually start single file. But going two abreast, of course, they've done that to try to mix it up, make it more exciting for the fans. Yeah. But there is that safety issue. Yeah. Like you say, turning into turn one at 232, you don't go two abreast. <laughs> well, if you do, it's uh, that famous race when Michael Andretti and Rick had their duel uh, mm -hmm. the last five laps. And Michael passed Rick on the outside of one which was stunning. And I remember the announcers going nuts. And then the next lap, Rick came back and passed him on the outside of turn one again and went on to win. But uh, you bring up a good point. The Andretti Racing Organization had a horrible qualifying. Terrible. And not only that, uh, Ryan Hunter Ray doesn't make the race, and Michael makes a deal with AJ Foyt to pull Bruno Junquera out of the car and put Ryan Hunter Ray in. Now, you know, I got a lot of email about this. This was quite the hot topic. I mean, even indie drivers were twittering about it, you know, just saying, you know. But I forget who it was. It was either a Frank Keaty or Dixon was basically said, you know, hate to remind everybody, but this is a business. Not only is it a business, this is not the first time it's happened it's by a long the stretch. There's happened. a long history of that. Of course, with 100 years, you can have a long yeah. history of everything there. But. Is it fair to Bruno? No, but uh, it has happened. Right. And, uh, you know, people write in, that means the whole qualifying was a waste. No, it wasn't a waste. You know, you still have the people who went fast. Well, and, and again, what people have to remember, because India is unlike any other race that I'm aware of, the, the car qualifies. Right. Not the driver. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if somebody got sick or something, for example, you could throw another driver in the car, no problem. But if there's a problem with the car, you can't substitute it. No. Yeah, the car so, qualifies, not the driver. And... Uh, A.J. Foyt will retain car owner points, but Ryan hunter Ray will get driver's points for the Indy. Oh, is that right? I didn't yeah. know that little wrinkle on it, too. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be... It's going to be a most interesting race. And we've got four women running, and everybody knows Danica Patrick, but you and I have talked a lot about Simona Del Silvestro because well, I'll tell this you girl what, can drive. Yeah, she can drive, and I, I was remiss to mentioning her on the site this week because she had a horrendous crash in when practice. A, when a piece broke on the car. And she had her hands badly burned. Well, not, you know, 
burned. I mean, second degree. Yeah, and she she said, I mean, it was all she could do to qualify, and which I thought she did a tremendous job. So if she's feeling good, yeah, I think. Simona is probably the most talented female racer to come along in a long, or ever. Right. And, and good on both the ovals and the road course. Yeah. And uh, Pippa Mann. Uh, the, I don't know anything about her. Yeah, she's a young Brit. And uh, I think she's pretty impressive. I, I, you know, I know her, her, the people on her team are quite impressed with her. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then you have Anna Beatrice, as she's been in uh, before. And, you know, Danica runs real well at Indy, so... Oh, Danica, she's a serious competitor. Yeah, no, Danica, you know, everyone says, well, who's going to win? I said, well, any one of 15 drivers can win the race, realistically, maybe 20. Uh, but I'm just hoping that the, the first few laps isn't a horrendous, you know, I hope everyone... Yeah, doesn't I, I, crash. It, you know, and it, it's always one of my favorites who gets knocked out, it seems, in those early crashes. Yeah, it just ruins the race, really. I just hope they can not have that happen and get sorted out, and then you're going to see some drivers just steam into the front. And I thought, you know, Paul Tracy uh, did a great for his team qualifying, and, you know, he could be a factor, too, so... Everything's... Uh, <laughs> well, what I find interesting, too, about Indy is we have what I guess you might call yeoman race drivers. This is the only race in the year that they do. Yeah. I mean, they do Indy, and that's it. And I, I'm not aware of any other series where you see drivers pop in for just one race. Well, there's only a few of them this year. Now, Dan Weldon, I think, is going to run some more. But, you know, he's won Indy. Right. So, But he's, uh, he's on but the outside Buddy of Rice, road. Too. Buddy yeah. in for this race, right? And yeah. Ed Carpenter, I think that this is the only race he does. Well, no, oh, Ed, no, no. Ed is driving for Sarah Fisher, who's pregnant. So Ed's got that ride. Davey Hamilton, that's the one I'm yeah, going to say. Davey just does this race. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's going to be interesting. I mean, Elio Castro Neves, he's not used to starting in the sixth row. Well, he's having a terrible year. Yeah. I don't know what's gone on. There's something wrong in his head. I, and I don't mean like crazy or sick or something, but I just think he's lost his edge this year. Well, something's not right. But, I, you know, people say, hey, who's going to win? Well, I mean, obviously, any of the Penske or Ganassi drivers are still, you know, going to Gotta be Got to be there. the favorites going in. Yeah. Uh, Tagliani can win. Yes, He's a can. smart, talented driver. Townsend Bell is another one in the inside of road, too. He's really good at the speedway. But when you have Scott Dixon in the middle of the front row, uh, you know, we'll see. I hope they don't have a big wreck at the beginning. I hope it stays green the first 25 laps, and then we'll see. Um, that's a good first 25 laps, you'll get a good idea. Okay, so we're, we're going to have to take a break here in a second, but I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> no, I'll put myself on the spot. Who's going to win? I'm going to say Dario Franchitti wins his third Indy 500. Oh, my gosh. I'm going with Will Power only because the guy has been so dominant so far this season. Yeah. And I think he's in the zone, and uh, he's the best position to the Penske drivers right now. So that's where my money is right now. Although, uh, that's my... My prediction, I'd be happy with a lot of other drivers. Oh, I'd be happy a lot with a lot of drivers. I'd actually like to see Danica be the Me first too. I woman think it'd be to so win. so awesome for her to win on the 100th anniversary. And awesome for the sport. Yeah. I mean, the media attention would be, after all this horrible news with the tornadoes and stuff, it would be nice to have that sort of a... Yeah, it'd be really cool. Well, Peter, we're going to have to cut you loose so you can get to, down to Indianapolis. Yeah, so I'll... I'll be glad to go, and we'll talk about it maybe a little next week. Cool, and then we'll get uh, Russ Clark and uh, Todd Lassa in here. But now we've got to thank one of our great sponsors for bringing you this show. And uh, here's a message from Bridgestone. Bridgestone is featuring its third generation of run-flat tires with groundbreaking new technology. Current run-flat tires can offer peace of mind for consumers but the added mass and the stiffer sidewalls can compromise ride comfort and fuel efficiency. The new third generation Bridgestone run flat tires reduce heat and improve performance and ride comfort. Whether you're a program manager in the industry or just looking for a set for your personal car, check it out at BridgestoneTire.com. 
Well, we lost Peter DeLorenzo, but we just gained Russ Clark and Todd Lassa. And Russ, great to have you in here uh, talking all about marketing and yeah. certain products at Chevrolet. Tell us which ones you specifically concentrate on here. Well, first of all, thanks, John, for, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, at Chevrolet, I got the great pleasure to work on some really cool stuff. We've got uh, uh, Camaro and Corvette on my teams and, and a new Malibu that we're going to be launching here in the uh, uh, a few short months, and uh, as well as Impala. So uh, I've got fun stuff and, and uh, a lot of good business stuff too. So. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I've got to officially welcome more warmly here Todd Lassa from Motor Trend Magazine. Great having you back here, John, Todd. always good to be here. And, and Motor Trend Classics too. In fact, he, Todd just brought us in the latest issue of that, and it looks terrific. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm kind of proud of that when I've got the cover story on the 1959 Cadillac Cyclone. And, and t tell the viewers a little bit about that car because uh, it's Cadillac Cyclone not well known. Was, yeah, well, it was, it was designed at the very end of the uh, Harley Earl regime and actually ushered in the beginning of the Bill Mitchell regime. It also became the car that, um, that Ed Welburn saw when he was a kid and decided, I want to be a car designer. The car is a uh, two-seat Cadillac, but it has uh, it's a large car for a two-seater, and it's got a bubble top, a lot of future stuff. Very low slung. Very low slung. Go see uh, Motor, Trend, uh, Motor Trend Classic mm -hmm. and pick up a copy, and I think, uh, I think it's a good story. Um, just the story of how Ed Welburn is still involved with that car. I was able to talk to him uh, for the article. Also wrote about the uh, 44 Willie's MB, the, the 70th anniversary of the Jeep, and, and that was fun too. A lot of good stuff in that issue. Yeah, yeah, good, good looking book there. Thank you. Well, Russ, let's talk Chevrolet. I mean, Todd just mentioned the 70th anniversary of the Jeep. Chevrolet is celebrating its 100th anniversary this Absolutely. year. It's, uh, it's our 100th anniversary. Uh, started in uh, uh, 19, uh, what would that mean? 19 what, 1911. Right, uh, with uh, Louis Chevrolet and, and uh, William Durant forming Chevrolet. Uh, company, you know, based a lot on racing uh, to start with, with Louis Chevrolet, but always putting together a, a, a company and a business that's founded on, you know, value and performance and excitement and that sort of thing. So, 100 years of that to celebrate as well as uh, looking forward to where we're going in the future. And going next year to Indy, uh, and yep. you're, so you guys are making a big splash at Indy this year. It's 100th anniversary, your 100th anniversary. Uh, we're sharing that with the Indianapolis this weekend. Uh, their 100th, our 100th, uh, the Camaro will pace the uh, Indy 500 uh, for the seventh time this year for Camaro, the 22nd time for Chevrolet. Uh, throughout that history, and um, w we created a, a special edition for for that pace car that's kind of reminiscent of the iconic 1969 Camaro pace car with a white and orange uh, color scheme. And of course, AJ Foyt's driving the uh, the pace car. I'm sure you guys are glad he's driving it, and not <laughs> Donald Trump, who was originally scheduled to be. We all wanted to see what would happen yeah. to his hair yeah. if he drove the car. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know, AJ had was really more associated with Ford in most of his career. So I think that's a little bit of a coup for you guys to have AJ well, driving proud, your we're, pace car. We're proud to have him and uh, we know he'll he'll be able to use what the what the Camaro can offer too uh, in terms of driving around in front of the grid. And um, uh, you know from an overall perspective uh, in Chevrolet's history at in Indianapolis and, and then going next year as you mentioned John uh, with a all new Chevrolet engine, 2.2 liter twin turbo V6, uh, working together with Elmore Racing to develop the engine, and then of course Penske being a first team to sign up for it. So we're excited. Oh, for is that right? I wasn't aware of that. That Penske already signed up for that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, yeah, I, uh, looking forward to it, and it, uh, it's great to see Chevy back in there. It would be nice to see that series become uh, multiple engines yeah. again, yeah. and I'm sure you'd like to see that as oh, well. Oh, I think it'd be interesting. Yeah, well, certainly we're glad we've got a great history with. Uh, with it, I think uh, six champions uh, in Chevrolets uh, over the years, and, um, uh, and and I think it's great for the fans too, uh, and, and generate a lot more interest in in the. Sure, it is. I mean, you know, look, we're really glad that Honda was in there because it carried the water yeah, there. Yeah, Nobody else was around, but I think even Honda really wants others in there. It doesn't want to race against itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, competition's always good. It is. You know, competition's always good. Well, and, and, you know, the argument has been made for a long, long time, how valuable is racing to uh, selling, you know, race on Sunday, win on Sunday, 
uh, so on Monday. And you're, you're coming out of a period where, of course, uh, GM had to restructure, go through bankruptcy. Uh, you had a couple of lean years, and of course now you're working on a lot of new product for the next few years. But um, how hard was it to, how hard was the decision for GM to say, okay, we're going to, at this point, just a few years after things looked so dismal, at this point get back into um, a very expensive but a very high profile kind of racing? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think from an overall pers perspective, uh, in racing, it's all about learning how to make better cars, better engines, and technology as we continue to go forward to get every bit of uh, power and as well as fuel efficiency out of engines. Racing allows you to, to work on uh, a lot of things that help us do that. Um, and then, of course, uh, it's a way to reach customers, too. Uh, and uh, like with Corvette and our uh, ALMS uh, racing with the Corvette, um, we take what we learn in racing and apply it to the production cars and then vice versa. So uh, I, th I know you had Doug and uh, Doug Feith. Yeah, Doug Feith we had in here yeah, last year, right? Yeah, a while back. And it, it's really true. We, we race to make a better production car, and our production car helps us make a better race well, car, too. But can you give us a little insight? Was there a lot of internal discussion and argument? W oh. Was there a big faction that said, no, we can't do this now? Um, I think it, it becomes, you know, we've created a whole group now called Motorsports under Jim Campbell. So sure. I think there's a big emphasis and, and effort now to, to say, look, a real car company and, and a b major force in the car company needs to, to touch all bases. So, so uh, and, and Indy has been something with great heritage and uh, something we, we really believe is a strong, strong uh, uh, program for us uh, to get back into. As far as what went on, yeah, sure. There, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion, Todd, in, in number of rooms, and we have to make a good business decision wherever we do. So, uh, so all that w went into it. So obviously, it's a good business decision yeah. because you're getting well, back we in. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk uh, about some new product you guys got coming up. Yeah. You teased us by showing us the new Malibu at the New York Auto Show this year. What are the plans for this car? I mean, Malibu's been going pretty strong. Yep. This is the strongest Malibu in a long time, the current one. Current one. It, what do you plan to do with the, the next gen that's coming? When is that, next year? Uh, early next year, first quarter next year, we will launch with a, an all-new Malibu, uh, starting out with what we call the Eco model, which will have the e-assist technology in it. Um, we're estimating 27 miles per gallon city, 38 highway. Uh, with that car. So uh, launching again with the, the newest technology and the highest fuel economy into a segment. Uh, the styling, the way we talk about the car is you're going to feel great walking up to it. You're going to enjoy sitting in it. Well, styling on walking up to it, you know, it's got a lot of Camaro. Uh, I was going to say, there the are back. definitely Camaro design yeah. cues in design this new cues. design. It's sportier than today's. Today's is more elegant looking uh, Malibu. This one takes on a little sporty. It's wider. It's got a uh, wider footprint. Um, and uh, then you sit in the interior is just amazing with the quality of materials and the infotainment. We will have uh, the seven inch color uh, touch screens in there with uh, Pandora and Stitcher capability. And, and um, then when you drive it, the ride and handling, uh, we think uh, should surprise a lot of people uh, with the car. <coughs> and, uh, and then when you own it too. Um, uh, you know, we've got our warranty, the five-year, 100,000-mile warranty, and, and the level of quality that's in the car. So uh, we, we like to say whoever buys it is going to be the happiest guy on the street. You know, I always thought that the current generation Malibu should be doing better than it has. Mm -hmm. What is it? Why is it that that car didn't catch on like I think it should have? And, and well, what are you going to do with this next generation to bump sales up even more? Um, I guess uh, I would say I think it has caught on it, it uh, and it's kind of catching on that I like. We've had three years of increased sales and increased market share in a very competitive segment. You know, a couple of those years uh, uh, were tough years, both uh, for the industry as well as GM, and to still to post in, uh, increased sales and, and share with the car, uh, we think it's a great testament to how good it is. So three years in a row, and this year we're ahead of last year too. So it, it could very easily be four years in a row of increased share and, and uh, increased sales volume on the car. Um, like I said, very competitive segment. Uh, things we'll do on the next car to uh, even take it to that next level. Um, while this car, when it came out, uh, I think set some styling, uh, uh, blew some people away with some styling both inside and out, I think we'll do that again. Uh, but we'll add a lot more technology in the car, uh, this time from an infotainment perspective, and uh, more fuel economy, too. 
You know, the, the current generation car to me seemed to be designed, if you will, more European-like. In, mm -hmm. in fact, almost Volkswagen-like, mm -hmm. whereas the next generation, definitely an American-style car. Yeah. Yeah, we're, uh, well, it's got the, the, fr the face of Chevrolet, the global face, and, and it is a global Chevrolet now. Um, we'll sell this car in almost 100 countries the, as a Chevrolet Malibu. Um, and uh, let's see, with, uh, with that kind of footprint, it'll help Chevrolet continue to grow globally. We sold uh, a little over 4.2 million cars last year globally for Chevrolet, that's uh, delivering one about every seven and a half seconds on average <laughs> around the world. <laughs> He's got the facts so, at his fingertips. Well, you know, speaking of the facts, you, you've sold the, you've, you've done pretty well with the current Malibu, yeah. and, and it's really, it's a tough act to follow, and especially when you look at what Malibu was a couple of generations, the two generations before that, and how far it's come, and now, you know, it, it, it's kind of an incremental leap next. But um, you've, it seems like you've gone for, kind of splitting up the segment between, if I look at monthly sales, the slightly larger Chevy Impala mm -hmm. and the Chevy Malibu have kind of traded places in terms of numbers at, at, at mm -hmm. Chevrolet almost every month going back many years. And of course, the Impala does more fleet now than the Malibu does. But I, I wonder if you had done less emphasis on the Impala, whether the Mal Malibu might have you know, kind of sprung into the, um, uh, the same sort of numbers that we see from Toyota Camry and Honda Accord, the top sellers in the category. Yeah. Well, we'll do um, right around 200,000 Malibus this year, and I know Toyota and, and uh, Honda have traditionally done much more than About that. Twice that, yeah. Well, if we look at where the segment's gone, it's, it's very competitive, mm -hmm. uh, much more so than it was five years ago. We were kind of the first mover to move up into that uh, category of uh, a real competitor to, to Honda and Toyota. We've been followed quickly by uh, a couple of our uh, close colleagues, Ford and, and Nissan, and they've all moved up. So, they, and that time the shares of uh, Honda and Toyota have come down, and it's it's all kind of congealing in this. Everybody, it's it's almost like the European uh, market. There's six major players, that, and Malibu is one of the key ones there that do about 80 percent of the midsize segment. Right? And, and I find it interesting too that you're following Hyundai into being, uh, I think, maybe the second among all those major players in offering only a four-cylinder with the next Malibu, mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing. Yeah. I think that's where the the the, mark, the, the whole industry is heading. Right. But can you talk about that a little bit? Well, a, we'll have a family, a new family of four-cylinder engines, a 2.5 liter. Uh, so uh, that's a, a pretty over, big four. Yep, yeah, a little over 190 horsepower uh, and 188, I think, is the torque on it. So the performance of the car. Uh, will be extremely good, and actually pretty close to this year's V6, okay, with the four-cylinder, and that's with, uh, you know, the fuel economy in the uh, low 30s, low to mid 30s for a highway. The uh, Eco model is a 2.4 liter, uh, 180 horsepower, so plenty of uh, oomph there, too, uh, with an additional uh, 12 horsepower with the electronic motor generator. So, um, uh, the four cylinders themselves, and, and the segment really is about 85, 90 percent four cylinder, always has been. Um, so there's, uh, we have a family of four cylinders, and, and uh, we think it's, it's the right move for, for this segment. You know, Todd made mention of two generations ago Malibu, which in my book was not a pleasing car to look at. Not you know, it wasn't that it was bad, but it wasn't yeah. like pleasing. And General Motors has got a history of when a car does bad in the market, not just GM, mm -hmm. I would say Ford and Chrysler too. When a car does bad in the market, whoop, drop that name. Mm -hmm. It's an, earned itself a, you know, a poor image. Yet you've stuck with the Malibu name. Why? Well, it, it, it's always a, a, a argument, if you will, what to do. Um, there's an awful lot of equity built up in the Malibu name. We found that the name itself always still conjures up a very positive uh, a relationship with consumers and the brand, and it also you want to get the momentum uh, and continue to build it in the car. So um, it wasn't a hard decision to keep keep Malibu on, even when we went to the to the uh, new one, the current model. Um, it, there was discussion. Yeah, should should we call it something else? But uh, uh, then you look at what does that cost to seed seed a name and and get the awareness up there. So What's when you got if you got to put a new name in the marketplace. 
how many well, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars do you have to spend to establish that name in the consumer's mind? What did it cost for Cruise, for example? No, I, I don't have the numbers, but let, let's just put it in the range of a, a good Powerball, uh, good Powerball jackpot. <laughs> so that, that's about where where you got to spend, and it's over time. So, um, so several hundred million dollars could, you're could, talking about it could be. Uh, Wow, yeah. including all the marketing going forward w right. well into the cycle cycle of the car, yeah, yeah. sure. And uh, uh, I, th I think overall a good car is really what's, what's really important uh, in terms of that. And uh, a good car will help a name, and a name that won't necessarily help a bad car. So, so we're, uh, we're, we're very pleased we've got a lot of great cars to put our names on these days. Hey, we've got to take a, a quick commercial break, and wouldn't you know it, the, we're going to get a message here from our great friends at Chevrolet, and oh, we thank great. you for sponsoring this program. Not only does the Chevrolet Cruze offer a ton of features, it features some of the best safety and maintenance in the business. The Cruze comes with rear park assist, which beeps if you're about to back into something. It has rollover mitigation, which means the car senses if it might roll over and applies the brakes to the outside front tire to bring the car back under control. And it has OnStar Vehicle Diagnostics, which sends you emails about the latest status of your car. And you can learn a lot more about it at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. I think both of you guys are going to be in the hunt. Yeah. Russ, uh, we've been talking about uh, the Malibu here. General Motors announced uh, this week that it's also going to be putting the new Chevy Impala mm -hmm. in the Hamtramck plant. So tell us a bit about this car, too, because the, the current version's been around a long time. Uh, it's been tweaked over the years. Uh, selling very well, but mainly as a fleet car. What are your plans with the, the Impala going forward? Well, we've, we've announced, as you said, that we're going to build the car uh, in, in Hamtramck. It's about as far as we're going these days on, on talking about it. Um, uh, I can tell you, it, I really think it'll be a really exciting car. The current car has done well uh, for us. Uh, it has uh, gone on a fairly long life cycle for, for a large car, but it's, it's doing very well in its segment. Uh, yes, it does do a lot of fleet cars, but that's because the fleets demand it. Uh, they want the, the larger car with the trunk and the good gas mileage, so, so it's a great car for them. It's also a great value for the retail customer, and we're doing you know, four to 5000 a month on average with the car, so that's not, At, a, in small, retail. In retail. It's right. not, not a small or insignificant number. Right, but close to 20000 or so all, yeah. all in. All in, right. So, but you've got some tweaks coming for it next year, right? Oh yeah, yes. For the uh, 12 Impala, we're uh, we're putting in the the high feature V6, 3.6 uh, liter. Uh, it'll get just a little over 300 horsepower in the car, uh, over and 30 miles per gallon highway. So, um, while cars continue to have great value, and even even improving the the car as it sits right now. So. Oh, we're excited about that. A couple little tweaks on grills and that sort of thing to make a little bit of difference in the look. But uh, uh, it's been a great car to drive, and that'll be even more fun too. And you've got Camaro and Corvette as well. You mentioned. Yeah. So uh, Camaro has gone to the head of the class here. It's easily outselling the Mustang and mm -hmm. and the Dodge Challenger as yeah. well. Uh, well, you know, it's got a great heritage and. Um, a lot of a great following, but uh, the car is just a blast. Uh, I'm driving one now. I've got a Camaro convertible that I, I drive around, and it's just fun. Like you know, last night as I checked out of the the garage, I love your car. You know, it's great. So, um, but uh, we we have uh, the largest uh, our largest um, uh, web enthusiast club, Camaro Five. They, they do fan fest, uh, and the, the the people that come and just to to talk about Camaro. So this year we. We brought the convertible out. We announced the ZL1 uh, product coming ne early next year, and we, we showed that in Chicago, a supercharged uh, uh, Camaro. So uh, ex everybody's excited about that coming. So we just want to keep the excitement up around Camaro and keep it building. Um, and like I said, nobody's in a sales race. We're very happy to sell the number that we do, though. Well, and uh, the, the heritage of that car is actually that, frankly, the, over, over all the years, I think, um, except for one or two years, Ford Mustang has beat it in mm -hmm. sales um, since 19, since uh, the 67 Camaro, uh, maybe 82, and uh, might have might have beat Mustang in the first or second year or something. But what, what's happening here? Why are you staying ahead of Mustang? I mean, they have not stood still either. Ford nope. has... 
upgraded that car and done a pretty nice job. Very nice frankly. job. Mm -hmm. So, what what do you think is happening? Well, the <clears throat> in the we're new, we have a great style. Um, it certainly stands out. Uh, there's there aren't as many of them, per, let's say, as on the road. Um, it's a very competitive car, and I just think it, it's a car that epitomizes the passion uh, that people have around our brand and around uh, the Camaro especially. So, But is some of it maybe pent-up demand? It. Because sure. you, you pulled the car out of the market for, I can't 80, remember. Uh, 2002, I think was the last Okay, year. so, uh, you know, yeah, eight years, nine to years or something like nine, that. Right. So, I mean, are, are you just riding a wave now of a bunch of people coming back and then it's going to tail off, or where do you see it going? Well, um, certainly there's, there's that element, uh, but things like we did with the Transformer movies that brought a whole new generation pe of people, the younger people that, that saw the movies, saw the, the vehicle and Transformers, and, and now that's become a great uh, vehicle for a new generation of people. So we'll continue to have that uh, feed it. We're, we'll continue to bring out uh, new and exciting things for the car. Um, like the special editions, the Indy 500, the Neiman Marcus car we did with it. Uh, we have a, a, a what we call a Synergy series that uh, we build. It's a combination of accessories and some unique things we do in the plant that allows the customer to buy special products. Everybody, not only they want a Camaro, they want to make it theirs. And uh, we're going to continue to try and make that happen for them. That's got to be very important because, of course, that segment is known for dropping off after the first year. You point out that yeah. it was new and fresh, but uh, typically coupes especially yeah. um, drop off after the first right. year, year and a half of sales. But And, you know, the convertible comes in, and, yeah. and it, in the segment, that's roughly about 20 to 25 percent of the of the sales. Right. And right. Uh, we're, we're exceeding that now because of the same thing, pent-up demand. Uh, for the convertible, but it'll level out, you know, in that in that range. But that's 25 percent we didn't have before. What's your V6 to V8 take rate on on that car? On the convertible? Well, no, on the uh, Camaro overall, altogether. It's you know. about 60 percent V6. I'm guessing it's higher on the convertible, right? Uh, not right now, but no. we do expect, but you expect it, to it to be, be higher. We do expect it to be. It, the convertible is following the same pattern the coupe did, which right. is the the enthusiasts are coming out first. The traditional enthusiasts and and the V8, uh, the coupe started out like 60, 65 percent, mm -hmm. and it's now, of course, with gas prices and everything too. But sure. our our V6 is 312 horsepower, and next year 323. So, so do these high gas prices hurt cars like Camaro and Corvette, especially? Uh, they haven't hurt uh, Camaro, and Corvette uh, actually has had. Uh, three relatively good months in a row now for sales. Uh, it's showing some renewed strength. And, and that's more of a segment issue for the Corvette. Um, we're still 30% of that segment. It's not a lot of players, but it's a luxury sports car segment. And we're still the number one player in 30%. It's, and we'll, whether the segment's large or small, that seems to be the per penetration we always get. So, um, And we're doing a lot of things with Corvette, too. Uh, we've, uh, or have a Centennial Edition coming out, uh, which is, I don't know if you've seen that one. No, I haven't seen uh, that. We were putting carbon black or carbon flash, the metallic black paint, and that's a, it'll be exclusive to that car. Is this that, that of what dark. I call a satin look or flat no, it's black? A, it's a metallic black. Okay. Okay. And so it's got a gleam or a shine to it. Well, the red, red uh, striped wheels with the red calipers, and it, it's a rather unique looking uh, Corvette. It's generated a lot of attention for us. Uh, and that's to celebrate our 100th, uh, help us celebrate our 100th year. Remember, I so said we, we were born out of racing, and what, what other car sh what are, would be best to kind of create a 100th anniversary celebration car than a Corvette? And then you've got a 50th anniversary of the Corvette coming up in uh, not, uh, yeah, not uh, too long. The following uh, year would be 53, our 50th. so 2013, yeah. right? Would be our 50th. Or 60th, rather. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. I'm, I'm taking 10 years off. I got a lot of anniversaries. This year's a 45th for, for Camaro. <laughs> so, yeah. And we, we've got one of those, too. Let so. me put you on the spot if I could ask you to, pre to predict um, where... The, the the heart of the segment is uh, heart of the uh, market is going to go uh, regarding Chevy Cruze and Chevy Malibu. You know everybody's been predicting that uh, as gas prices even before gas prices went up that the C segment would become the predominant segment uh, for sedans mm -hmm. in the United States. Both you and some of your competitors have been saying that. You came out with a competitive uh, C segment car finally the Chevy right. Cruze, right. but now you have um, a a new CD uh, Malibu coming out next year, and that has has traditionally been the heart of the market, mm -hmm. and and you also have higher fuel mileage. And with bumping up the fuel mileage of mid-sized cars, um, is four dollar a gallon gas going to give 
the, the market to the, the C segment or the CD segment, do you think? Uh, I think both segments will benefit. I think uh, the C might see more growth okay. because it started out on a little bit smaller base. You think uh, CD will remain the predominant segment, though? I think so. I mean, uh, that's where the heart of the customer market is. If you look at the demographic and, and you say, what's the average new car buyer? It, it, and then you look at the demographics of the mid-sized car buyers. I mean, they're almost identical. So yeah. so you, um, <clears throat> so you, that's still the bulk of the market. The, the C may grow a little bit more, at least my, my perspective, just because it starts out smaller. And as, and as people decide, and, and they're saying, I'm looking for more fuel economy in my next vehicle. And, and people manage their household fleets where they might have had two large vehicles before. Now they have one and then they'll, they'll go out and buy a smaller car. And, and car prices are going up. Car prices? Will, will that affect that at all, do you think? Uh, sure. People have to stay in budgets too. Yeah. So uh, they'll look for the most they can get for, uh, for what they have uh, available to them to spend on their transportation budget. And the uh, fuel economy plays a part in that as well as the car payment, of course. Yeah. And, um, and cars, yes, they are getting more expensive. The technology required to uh, to hit the fuel economy targets, the uh, um, uh, everything we're putting into them, uh, and, and all the new features too that people want in cars. Uh, you get a nicely equipped C car for what you used to pay for a kind of nicely equipped CD car, but more equipment now yeah. with all the electronics. But right now, like with uh, Cruise and Malibu, when we talked about Malibu's, uh, you know, three four years in a row. Cruises come in and kind of re start. Looks like it's starting to repeat that, where Chevrolet's come into a very competitive segment and now is doing very, very well in it. And the, both cars are complementing each other. Mm -hmm. So we're having record Malibu months as well as the cruises, like hitting it out of the park for us. They're almost selling in identical numbers now, yeah, right? at least cruise, in the last cruises, month. Cruises. Uh, for a couple of months, we're about the same cruises. Actually, we're selling a few more cruises, but everybody's happy about that, especially the dealers and, and us. And, and is cruise higher retail percentage or versus Malibu? Right now, yeah. 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 But you expect, obviously, that'll change with the new Malibu. Sure. Sure. Hey, uh, let's get to our viewer questions. Okay. But we've got to take another break right now, and we really want to thank Hyundai for sponsoring this show. The sixth generation of the Hyundai Sonata is taking the industry by storm, and no wonder. It offers a fluidic design theme that gives it a strikingly modern, coupe-like exterior design, and yet the interior provides the roominess of a full-size car as measured by the EPA. The Sonata also provides an eco-friendly interior with soy-based foam for the seats. Put it all together with Hyundai's strong reliability and value proposition, and you've got yourself a really compelling package. Check it all out at HyundaiSonata.com. Okay, okay, it's time for rapid fire. Ben, let's bring in the music. Okay, Beauregard Jackson writes in to say, why the decision to start manufacturing the Impala, Impala in Detroit? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, uh, from a, everything we look at is always on the manufacturing footprint. You know, where's the best place to do it? Clearly, uh, Detroit's our home. Uh, it's a flagship car for us, so uh, it's, that's kind of a nice fit. But uh, uh, it, it, there's a lot of decisions that go into what, where, where to build the car, and uh, uh, we're just happy to, to be able to say we can do it here in Detroit and add uh, up to 2,500 jobs. Yeah, and, and it's also being made in Oshawa, Canada. It's mm -hmm. going to be built in both places now. Do you see that much demand for the car? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we hope to do very well with the car. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, large, large corporations like to buy uh, <coughs> cars, and they like Impalas, so there's always demand there. Uh, and we've always done extremely well coming out with the new one. And uh, we're, we're excited about the new one, but that's about all I'll say about it. <laughs> okay. Right? Jay Cujo wants to know, will the current Camaro be killed or will it have a next generation? Well, we'd certainly plan on the next generation. Uh, we brought the Camaro back to stay, so, so that is our plan. George from Brooklyn wants to know, what platform will the new Impala ride on? We haven't talked about any of the um, elements of the car yet, um, but uh, I'll just continue to say it's uh, we, you we're can very excited about for that. We've yeah. had a little bit on the car. Yeah. Oh yeah. What, what are you guys saying, Todd? Uh, well, Epsilon Two, uh, but a stretched, uh, maybe bigger than the um, than the Buick LaCrosse, uh, and so with V6 and 
uh, V6 power, obviously. Yeah, front wheel drive. And front wheel drive, yes. Okay, George from Brooklyn wants to know, oh no, that's the one I just read. Unsprung wants to know, will uh, you also use the Kansas plant to make Malibus? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Greg says, I've driven the cruise and came away very impressed, but reviewers seem to be continually, continually complaining about two things. They say the six-speed auto is reluctant to downshift and is set too far forward towards fuel economy, and that the 1.4 turbo engine just doesn't produce, produce enough power for the weight of the car. Hmm. Um, well... Uh, I'll be glad to take that knowledge or the, the comments back to our team on, that works on crews. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in the car yet. I've been focusing. I, well, you know, I get a chance to drive Corvettes and Camaros. So, <laughs> so why drive a cruise? Yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, like I said, it, uh, the car's done uh, extremely well. The uh, uh, six speeds are always, you know, th there's more shifting going on. So, uh, and we do, uh, just like every other car, we, we have to focus as much as we can on fuel economy when we put them together. So. It's done very well. We, we, I think we like the car overall, but uh, we've, uh, some of my colleagues uh, have complained about the power as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, I see we got a, a phone call here. Ben, let's bring that in. John Sprint from San Diego. I was wondering if the new Malibu LT uh, trim level is going to have standard fog lights and alloy wheels to match the uh, Ford Fusion and the Hyundai Sonata out here that are selling very well in California. I can tell you from first-hand experience of actually selling cars that fog lights and alloys make a big difference at this trim level, uh, and the, the, the sales will increase quite a bit on the Malibu if you do that. And there's no problem putting the price of the options on the sticker. Nobody was going to blink about another one to three hundred dollars on the sticker. Well, five hundred dollars if you had the alloys on the sticker. Uh, your thoughts? Thanks. Sure. Uh, we'll have uh, three trim levels on the car, LS, LT, and LTZ. Uh, LT will have the alloys. Uh, and fog lamps? Fog lamps, uh, if, uh, if I'm correct, I think yes, or, or it may be the, act the first package you get, uh, will, and everything above that will include the, the may fog I, lamps. May I just say, I like fog lamps, but don't use them when, they're, when it's not foggy. Uh -huh. <laughs> they're for fog. They're for fog. <laughs> yeah. But apparently people just like the look of them, whether they're on or not, right? That, it, it, to, you know, That's fine, as long as they're not on when it's not foggy. Okay. Uh, comment from Tony G. Uh, he wants to know, uh, Russ, can you tell us if we'll ever see a 3.6 liter option in the Equinox? The fuel economy for the current 3 liter V6 is about the same, but it is substantially less powerful than the 3.6. Yeah. No plans I know of at this point to put the 3.6 in the Equinox. So. Okay, Goggles Pisano wants to know, uh, he says the, the Cobalt had an SS edition, which was clearly the high performance version of the model. With the crews competing in touring car championships in Europe, why is there not a high performance street version that would reflect this? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I agree. <laughs> um, uh, let's, when we, you know, the car came out and, and focused on getting into the mainstream of the, the compact car segment and uh, with a p uh, focus on fuel economy at this time. So I've uh, seen we have I've an RS version of the vehicle, which uh, right now is more, more a little bit more looks than the, you know. A, a more show than more, go, more, more right. I, I've seen you guys go back and forth on whether every model should have an SS version. And, and the last I heard a few years ago was only on the serious mm -hmm. performance versions. Yeah, well, if you don't have a performance engine in the car, we, be we have uh, internal requirements in order to call it an SS, right. and they're all around stop, turn, go, and uh, yeah. to make sure that it isn't just uh, speed or you know, fast speed. It's got to stop and it's got to turn, and right. as well as go. Uh, so if if we can do it and it makes good business sense, uh, we we can pursue that. But if we if we don't think we can do it and or make good business sense, then it becomes diff more, a little more difficult. I see a tie-in with that 2.2 liter turbo Indian. Oh, there you go, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That would do it. Be an okay. interesting aftermarket. That would be. <laughs> Great. Okay, we got a question coming in from Facebook from Pedro Craig, who wants to know if GM's developing e-assist for its future V8s. Hmm. Um, again, a good question. Uh, a lot of the focus, again, will be on uh, you know, four cylinders in, the, in g gaining the best fuel economy you can. 
uh, out of the vehicle. So uh, I don't know of any plans to put e-assist on V8s, but that's that's me. I I don't know of any. Okay. Okay, and uh, let's see here. What else do we've got? Um, Here's a question. Where is the G8 or any rear drive four-door car at GM? Why does GM continue to ignore this important part of the market that wants rear drive? Hmm. Well, uh, we have uh, where the G8 was uh, produced, Holden. Uh, we are now importing the Caprice police car. Police car, right. Uh, become a cop. Uh, yeah, yeah, become a cop. There you go. Um, and uh, th there's always interest in... Uh, Wherever there's market opportunity for us, there's interest. So, well, fuel economy standards are going to get a lot stricter yes. going forward. Does that kill rear drive for passenger cars? I don't think it necessarily kills rear, rear drive, but because uh, there's a lot of technologies you can put in in the cars to improve it, they'll probably never. It, mass is really the, the killer for uh, for fuel economy. So, uh, if you can continue to make lightweight architectures and and rear wheel drive, uh, you can continue to do that. So. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, coming in. Uh, Jacob wants to know, will the C8 Corvette really have a hybrid powertrain as its main drivetrain, as Peter DeLorenzo thinks, and will the V8 be relegated to special orders? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's uh, a lot of speculation there. Uh, um, <laughs> I think he's talking about I the C7, uh, right? Uh, well, this says C8. C8. Okay. Uh, yeah. C7 is just C7 yet. So we haven't seen the C7 yet, but my understanding is that's a substantial redo of the current mm. platform, and the C8 is where it really starts to change. Well, we uh, we're, we're not here, I guess, necessarily to talk about that kind of future yeah. product. How about that but Malibu, you, right? How about that Malibu? <laughs> yeah, but I will tell you the the uh, Kirk Corvette, like I say, doing very well, um, and. Uh, like lots of exciting things here for its next uh, next couple of years, uh, and and uh, I know as you know Mark Royce was down in Bowling Green last week, I believe, and did right. announce announcing that, uh, uh, investment other... there to do the next generation uh, uh, Corvette. So uh, this is a strong future for it. That's about uh, you know, as much as I can say about the future cars. There was a report on the on the internet this morning. I think the Detroit Bureau broke it about uh, what engine was being designed for the next C7. I have to say I don't believe it, but can you talk about that at all? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, the uh, turbocharged three-liter overhead cam yeah, V8. Yeah. I, I I I'd like to hear someone just say no. That's ridiculous because I think it is. So why so, Todd? Well, because I I don't think uh, GM's ready to put that kind of money into an all-new engine yet, and, and that would have to be an engine that not only serves the the Corvette, but obviously you'd have to consider that for Cadillacs. It's possible. Maybe they're going to do it. I would be surprised to see it just a few years after they after GM canceled its last mm -hmm. uh, overhead cam V8 engine program. Yeah. Well, <laughs> non-committal from yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah that's, well, we're getting back that's to the not, not confirm or deny. Okay. All right. So. The the hybrid uh, uh, some sort of hybrid powertrain in the, in the vet. Uh, when we had Mark Royce on the show, he said at least when it comes to trucks, it's when you look down in the post 2016 time frame. He was saying in trucks, it's awfully hard to do without some sort of electrification right. in the car, some sort of battery boost to the whole thing. I gotta believe the same would be true of a sports car like the Vet. Well, this, the again mass is uh, another key thing, of course, with the truck. Uh, mass also begets capability at times too. Uh, you have to look at the volumes important. too. Yeah, and the and the volumes that yeah because of the way the I mean the Cafe is they yeah, sell billions of trucks but right. not Corvettes. So uh, uh, and we know Americans love their trucks too. So uh, yes, we have we, to, we have to continue to find a way to to comply and and do the right thing and and uh, make the trucks uh, do everything they've always done as well as get better fuel economy and and uh, the the standards are tough. And when you get into, uh, like I said, the smaller volume cars, and uh, it's also mass, like I said. So a Corvette doesn't weigh anywhere near as much as a, a full-size pickup. So you can you can do some things, and uh, it's got a little better better arrow too than a full-size pickup. So that think of all the uh, all the Corvettes that the uh, Chevy Volt can offset in cafe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. We've got some more phone calls here, Ben. Let's bring one in. Hi, this is uh, Dan from uh, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and I have a question regarding uh, the weight 
of American cars, Chevrolets, um, they do tend to, to be two to 300 pounds heavier when you look at their Asian and mm-hmm. sometimes European counterparts, and I just wondered how quickly that gap will be closed. Thank you. And, and I would add, not just European and Asian, too. I mean, Camaro's, the, the, you know, pretty heavy compared to the Mustang. Yeah, well, Camaro's, uh, to Dan's point there, is, is uh, 280 pounds, I think. Uh, and, and part of that is the fact that we, and again, as it all gets in engineering, you, you engineer bigger wheels, you have to have some mass for that, and the car's just bigger. Okay, than the Mustang, so that's about half and half. So, so. Um, but GM does have heavy vehicles, and, and we do, and it's something we're working on very hard uh, for even the current cars as well as the future cars. Uh, again, because what drives it again is, is fuel economy. Um, we tend to tend to want to make our cars uh, as good and strong and structurally safe and everything as possible, and um, and we're just going to continue to work on that. Yeah, actually, and I, I, I'm not trying to be an apologist for GM, but it's amazing that you guys get the fuel economy with you, that you do with the weight penalty that you're carrying. Yeah, well, the next uh, the Malibu, the next new Malibu will be lighter than the, the current one. And again, that gets back to committing to just right. a four-cylinder engine. Well, right? Yeah, because the um, current one carries a mass in the front to carry a, a, a V6 as well as a four. That's another reason to go to, to fours is, is so that the uh, architecture, the structure of the vehicle, can be sized specifically for that. I think Hyundai said that they saved 150 pounds. Is, is that a right number for, 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 with the on, on the Sonata? On the Sonata? Uh, of committing, can, can it be that much of a weight savings? Uh, depends where you start, I guess. Yeah, I guess yeah, it, it does. Depends on what your engines are for one yeah. thing. Right. Well, what about uh, high strength steel? Is it becoming more economic, economically viable for mainstream Chevrolets, or, or do you still have to be judicious? And how much you use? Well, uh, again, we, we balance everywhere cost and mass uh, as the two key drivers. Uh, we can we can probably develop cars that even do a much better fuel economy and much more much more safer, but nobody could afford them. Uh, we've got great engineers that, that uh, give them the challenge, and they'll they'll figure out how to do things. Um, but the high strength steel and the steel industry continues to evolve too, and, and come up with things that help us. So. Uh, it's just an ongoing effort everywhere. Does, does this new Malibu have more high strength steel? Than I, I the don't. One, I can't or? tell you uh, for sure. I don't know the, okay. the the numbers on it, but it is uh, it is lighter, it's faster, and it's better fuel economy. Uh, you know all the kinds of things you like to talk about when you bring out a new car. Better, better, better. Better, better, better. And uh, uh, what well, as good as the new one is, I think will even be will be better. And, and that's the other thing in that segment is, like I said, it's very competitive, and uh, you almost have to. Get in your head. I gotta go as far as I can, and then another step further, in order to continue to improve your position uh, in it. Uh, if, if all we're doing is playing catch up, we know where we start then. Mm-hmm. Okay, just in the back. Hey, we've got another phone call here. Ben, bring it in. Uh, my name is John Dunlap. Mm-hmm. I'm from the Missouri Ozarks, and I'm on. No, is GM are, uh, going to go in for more all-wheel drive vehicles? They are godsend for us living in the deep hills. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. And good question. What about all-wheel drive? Where do you see that going, Russ? Um, well, certainly in, uh, we do an excellent job in our uh, utilities, our compact utilities. Um, cars, I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, all-wheel drive, especially as the market continues to shift, can play a bigger role. We still haven't seen huge demand for it here um, in many of the car classes, but uh, you know, in, in uh, mid and, and larger cars, there, there's a potential role for it. More in the luxury end, yeah. would you say, though? More when you do rear wheel drive as opposed to front wheel drive, right? Yeah, but I think uh, uh, all wheel drive still will play uh, a future, but again, uh, it adds mass, yeah. it, it adds co- significant cost, too. So, uh, But you're right, it, it's easier in the rear wheel drives, at least with today's architectures. Good scent of win- winter tires will go a long way. Yes, they will. No. Uh, boy, I've always said, if I had to choose between all-wheel drive or snow tires yeah. in the winter, I'll take the snow tires okay. over all-wheel drive. I mean, I want both, but if that's my choice, I'll take the snow tires. It makes yeah. a dramatic difference. Right. we got another call. Ben, let's bring him in. Hey, guys. Good evening. This is Youngblood, Cleveland, Ohio. All right. Uh, a couple things. Uh, if you guys make a hot rod cruise, I got the name for it, and you can have the name. Call it the Cruise Missile. Cruise <laughs> Missile. Okay. 
And my <laughs> second question was over. is, yeah. before uh, GM yeah. hit that bankruptcy, they were supposedly developing a state-of-the-art diesel. I guess it was all aluminum. I don't know if it was a V6 or a V8, but it was ultra-high-tech and it's state-of-the-art everything. Is there a chance that this thing is still going and might we see it in something in the future? Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, uh, I'm not uh, particularly involved in that engine or anything in particular. The diesels uh, are always a, uh, an opportunity because uh, they do generate about 20% more efficiency, uh, but they also cost quite a bit more and with the emission rules in the future. Uh, it's almost prohibitive uh, from a buying the car perspective uh, as we go forward. So uh, diesels can play a role. It's something we've always said at GM. Uh, there is no one answer to uh, the issues that uh, we face as uh, foreign, uh, foreign fuels and, and greenhouse gas. It, there's, a, there's a lot of technology that answers. Diesels can play a role in that. But GM did develop what everybody's been raving oh, about. Oh, the, uh, the, the truck engine. The truck engine. Yeah. yeah so. And uh, which had the exhaust coming out of mm -hmm. the V, right, and the intake That's coming right. off the outside of the banks. And uh, I, I never got to drive the engine myself, but I mm -hmm. uh, have heard that a lot of people have just been raving about the thing. And I guess that program was killed as the company went into yeah. bankruptcy, mm -hmm. or even before that, as things started to melt down. Well, and there was some talk in a few months ago, and I didn't follow it perhaps as closely as I should have. And I, was it either Tom Stevens or Mark Royce or someone? made some comments where he said that we're, we're looking at it again or we're going to get back into it again. I don't think it was definitive. Um, yeah, but right. It's fully developed. Yeah. So it's a matter of just yeah. tooling it up and putting it in production should the company decide that's the way to go. Right, but that's, that's still a lot of money right there. <laughs> it, yeah. it is a lot of money, well, but there was a, a, a report that leaked out earlier this year that you guys are going to put a diesel in the cruise in the U.S. market because, of course, you've got it in markets elsewhere in the world. When Mark Royce was on the show, we asked him about it, and he said, we never released that. Well, it was somebody at the, uh, the Lordstown plant where the car is built. You know, because the union learns about stuff uh, before it goes into production. They want to know, are there going to be jobs? And sure. So it sounds to me like uh, you guys are looking at doing a diesel. And as you know, yeah, uh, a, a V6 or a V8 diesel... You're you're looking at three thousand bucks plus in emissions equipment, yeah. but if you're doing a four cylinder, mm -hmm. small two liter or less, you can get by with a whole lot less cost. Still after treatment. Still after treatment, but again, and, uh, uh, you know, in 2014, uh, as Europe goes to Euro six emissions, mm -hmm. and before we bump up to the next tier two bin, whatever it is. U.S. and European emission standards start to overlap. There's a sweet spot there for a number of years where I think the volume of, of manufacturing for the emission standards and all that emissions equipment is going to bring down the costs. So I guess I'm well, throwing out a bunch of things saying, what about diesels, Russ? Well, sounds good. <laughs> I, uh, I had the great opportunity in my career at GM to actually live and work in Europe. And, uh, you know, what came, I became a diesel fan. Um, I love driving them. Uh, I'd love to see us come up with one, but I'm not making any official announcements either. Yeah. <laughs> the president, president didn't make them. So. Well, you know, but, BMW uh, says yeah. in the U.S., by the end of this decade, half of all its vehicles are going to be diesels. Mm -hmm. and I find that an amazing st st half statistic. Half of them here in the U.S.? Half right? in the U.S. They have a price range that, that can absorb that, of it course. It can, but I'm also told that Volkswagen has tooled its uh, Chattanooga plant yes. that... Um, after the second refresh of the Passat that's coming out of that plant, it can go as high as 80% diesel. Hmm. And so, 40 mpg for, for a large uh, mid-sized car uh, yeah. on the highway is what the VW Passat gets. Sure. So, and I'm impressive. sure the diesel guys aren't sitting on their hands. I, I'm sure they're going to figure out ways of taking cost out of meeting those emission standards. So, They're, they're good engineers and they're, they love a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Russ hey, isn't talking. Yeah, I know he's not. And that's he's why we keep pushing job. him to see yeah, what well, we can know. get him to break on here. <laughs> right. Hey, look, we ought, we ought to wrap it up. We're, we're at the top of the hour. A um, couple of things here. Uh, 
We got four signed copies of Bob Lutz's new book, and we're going to give one away for free every Friday in June. And here's how you can enter the contest to be able to win one of those signed books of Bob Lutz's. You know, uh, our television program, Autoline Detroit, is now available to every public television station in the country. In fact, uh, well over 30 stations have picked up the show since uh, the, the beginning of the year. So if you want to win a book, we want you to send an email to your local public television station saying that you'd love to see them put Autoline on their lineup and then send us an email, a copy of that email. We're going to pick it out at random from those emails and you can win a, a signed copy of, uh, of Bob's book. And uh, so anyway, I, I really want to thank all you guys from, for coming on here, Russ and, uh, and, and Todd as well. In fact, uh, we want to remind our viewers that you can follow us at facebook.com slash autoline detroit and you can follow us at twitter at twitter.com slash autoline follow peter at autoextremist.com russ where do they go for all their chevrolet stuff chevrolet.com chevrolet.com and and mm -hmm. because you guys are sponsoring us with the cruise we'll say chevrolet.com slash cruise okay. as well and todd read me at motortrend.com motor city blog man and pick up the magazine if you get a chance. That's great. <laughs> it looks great, by the way. The thank magazine, you. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks, Jeff. Yeah, no, thanks, you guys, and thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. Before we leave, you should read the address uh, where people can send their emails. Just to, to viewer mail? Get, uh, it's bit, uh, get off the bit.ly address that I put in there, John, because that's got all the rules. Oh. Or tell them to go to the website. Oh, yeah, okay. So yeah, send your, uh, all the details of how to enter this contest are at bit.ly slash autoline contest, and that's bit dot ly slash autoline contest. Good enough? You bet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So well, did you drive your Camaro over here actually, tonight? Actually, uh, the engineers wanted to look at at it, so uh -oh. I, have, I have an Escalade. <laughs> so. Hey, oh, uh, d did you have a problem with it? You're not no, saying. No, no, no. <laughs> just an opportunity. I, I had, uh, just, so <laughs> just so you guys know, just so a heads up, but on uh, one of the Camaro convertibles in the press fleet, there's a wind noise on the passenger side that starts to manifest itself at around 45 uh, to 47 yeah. miles an hour. So I haven't driven one yet. I have to get in, in your Camaro convertible. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll admit, John, I got in it. No, I was out at, uh, in San Diego. We had the, the press thing, and I drove them from uh, Phoenix to San Diego. And uh, then I got in this one, uh, and I told Al Oppenheiser, I said, it seems a little noisier, in the, especially like from the right. Yeah. Right, so. Yeah, maybe it was the same car then. So, well, I don't know. No, this is my car. Oh, so, oh, oh. Yeah, this is my car. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm having them look at that. Yeah, well. But uh, I, it, it's, it's more, I think it, I consider it more a little bit road noise, a little bit more than I would have liked. No, this is definitely, definitely a whistle. A whistle, a whistle at it. the top of the window, you know, uh, and like I said, under 45, it didn't, yeah. you didn't hear it, but over 45 miles an hour, especially at highway speeds, you notice it. No, I, I don't notice that. Um, but I, boy, it's a blast to drive. And well, I, I, I it is a I blast sold my, to drive. Uh, I sold my '68 two years ago, so a '68 convertible. Oh boy! So I've had two Camaros in my my life: a '69 when I was in college. Oh my gosh! And then a '68 I bought about seven or eight years ago, and my kids and I had some fun with it.
neither car was special other than it was a convertible. First mm -hmm. one was a 307 with a three-speed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it had the gauges in the console. That's all that yeah. mattered. You could yeah. build the car any way you wanted back then. Well, it was yeah. a three-speed manual instead of a three-speed automatic, Yeah, three-speed right? manual, yeah. manual steering and brakes, but a power top, and then right. this, this... Lightweight, no, yeah, right. no power steering or brake. The 68 I had was a 327 power glide, but... <laughs> You know, I yeah. I like old cars like yeah. that. I think you know, I I, yeah. I hate to see when guys take one and, and have to drop the, the big engine in it. I, no, I love know, the smaller engines in them. There's something to be said about um, uh, a collectible that's just kind of a nice daily driver. That yeah, I mean, you know, you're not going to go racing it anyway. So I, I agree. I mean, but I'm not a drag racer. You know, I love. A light, nimble, handling hand car. But yeah. if I were a drag yeah. racer, man, I'd drop a, as oh, yeah. big an engine as I could drop in oh, that sure, thing. Sure. But but it's it's just fun. I like my car original. I don't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I'm. I'm. That's yeah. kind of what I'm getting at. I like that too. Yeah. Have you been through uh, Hendrix Museum down in Charlotte? No, I haven't. Oh. Hmm. It's uh You've been through the Heritage Center here. Oh, many times. I've a lot of the cars I've driven for Motor yeah. Trend Classic are from Heritage yeah. Center. So. But uh, going through Rick's uh, stuff down there, it's kind of like, I wonder who's better, our collection or his. <laughs> <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> he doesn't have all the unique, you know, one-off. Well, sure, sure. But, sure. but uh, he's got some pretty special Corvettes and Camaros. And, uh, he doesn't have the Electro there. <laughs> no, no. But, what? Uh, the electric Corvair they did in 66, yeah. I think. Uh, really? 65 or 66, yeah. Uh, it doesn't run, you know, I mean. Hmm. I learned to drive on a Corvair. It, oh, uh, wow. 65. Uh, I think it was a Monza, 140 horse, four speed. Yeah. Red was a bl uh, black Was that uh, the turbocharged one? No, I didn't have the turbo. I think it was a two or two uh, carburetors on it. Gosh, I should know this. I did a story on but Corvairs, too. Two cars I, I wish I would have kept from yeah. when I was growing up. My dad, the 62 Chrysler 300 convertible mm -hmm. yeah. and the Corvair convertible. You know, that second generation Corvair, it still looks good oh, to my yeah. eye. Yeah. It One of the best very designs clean yeah. design. Yeah. Oh, I like it. And uh, But you can't find them hardly anymore. That's I haven't seen a Corvair in ages. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, again, when I did the story, the, and the prices are kind of all over the place. I see them every now and then. Yeah, right. um, yeah Dream Cruise is yeah. maybe where you I'd see them. If you go to and you walk through the tents, you'll see you know, maybe 10 or 15 of them. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. There was a, a Gen 1 Corvair, I want to say it might have been a 62 coupe um, with a for sale sign on it forever on Woodward Avenue up in Royal Oak or Birmingham hmm. um, a few years ago. Yeah. So they're around. Yeah. Yeah. There are clubs and so on. I'm sure you can pick one up. Yeah. But that was a fun little car. Talk yeah. About light, Talk about light lightweight. Yeah. Lightweight, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That first one, that first generation was an extremely lightweight car. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Funky design, though. I never warmed up to the styling of that car. In fact, I never liked it and loved the second generation one. Yeah. In fact, I think you could take that car, put on modern headlamps on it, some more modern it's wheels, and people would just think it's a new car. Yeah. <laughs> I would give them any ideas. They didn't do that. <laughs> or maybe you should give them ideas. Maybe I it should. Be a bad, right. wouldn't be a bad thing. Well, I know one car that I wish we had done was that Bel Air uh, concept. I, yeah, I remember that. I wrote about that, too. And because yeah. uh, that's something, I, I bet you we could still be building that car today. Which which car is that? It what was, was it? built It was built on the, um, was it the S10 or the Colorado platform? I think it might have been S10 because the Colorado was changing right yeah. then. Yeah, so it was body on frame, yeah. and it was de designed to be, uh, to evoke the 55 right. Bel Air without being too yeah. too terribly retro. And the idea is you do it body on frame. Yeah. Guess what? After a few years, you do a 56. Just the body. Yeah. Right. And after a few years after that, you do the 57, yeah. which I think might have been a little bit outrageous. I, you know, I can't imagine bringing back those sorts of fins now. But, yeah. you know, that was the idea. Mm. But uh, that had a lot more legs than the SSR, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. You're right, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I think the Bel Air name is a name you could oh. probably bring back in a modern car, too. You know, the SSR, I thought, was drop-dead gorgeous, but the, the, the two things that I think hurt it coming out of the box, there were a lot of quality issues with it, and it, it had no guts. Yeah. The first engine that they dropped in the there, I, I don't think you could lay a patch in that thing. I, I, I hate to say it, 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 
it was a uh, it, it followed that rule about the um, uh, what was the uh, the amphicar, uh, where someone said it was neither neither a good car nor a good boat, <laughs> and to me the SSR was neither a good sports car nor a good truck. It didn't do either of those. No, things it didn't really well. But it looked really cool. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. I'm I'm with you though. I you know what I like there. though was uh, the cyclone and the typhoon. If oh, you remember those, those that uh, yeah. GMC had? Yeah. Those, those I had liked a, few a lot. Problems, though, John, so. Did they really? <laughs> oh, I guess the ones I drove were pretty. Ones I think a powertrain and uh, uh, durability yeah. ones. So, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they were they were rather they unique were in their days. They were rocket, fast. yeah, rocket fast. Yeah. So. In fact, which was the? I, I can never remember which one was which, but the. The SUV one was that the Cyclone? No, I think that was at the time. Anyway, the, the, the one that was a little SUV, the little S10 based one, was all-wheel drive. Yeah. And what, what I found so awesome, it was almost impossible to get the wheels to spin. Mm -hmm. But you just shot like a bat out of hell when you nailed it. I mean, yeah. just because it put the power down so well. Yeah. yeah. When I did uh, worked on the Trailblazer SS, the uh, engineers went, it's got to be all all wheel drive, all wheel drive. I said, I'll be glad to sell some all wheel drive, but you got to make it rear wheel drive too. Yeah. And right. Did, so. Yeah. But uh, they were going to make it all wheel drive, and I said no. <laughs> so, that worked cool. out nicely. I mean, that came out when you you kind of brought back the SS name to a certain. I mean, you had it around, but you kind of brought it back for a few products back then. And the and the uh, the blazer. I mean, the the um, trailblazer was by far the best. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've met some uh, people who own them, and they're like uh, zealots on the thing. So and pretty well, rare. Why are you, the the new Camaro? It's the two SS. Why is that? Well, it, those are just like uh, content or trim levels. So the, oh, are the, they? The SSs okay. are the uh, the V8s. Uh, okay. LS3 V8s. Mm -hmm. And the L uh, this regular Camaro was the V6. So we got a one LT and a two. We got an LS. Now we have a two LS. Uh, that's because uh, we have a special model. It gets 30 miles per gallon highway. We lowered a little bit and put on a spoiler and closed off the front. But on the Monroney and all the data I had, it said numeral or number two SS. Okay. And that's just a trim level, or well, technically it's a model. Okay. The way we price and everything. But it doesn't it's appear the, on the car that way. It just says SS. Right. right. SS, right. So. But I, me, just to be correct, it's uh, you know everything that I wrote about it. I said this is the two SS <laughs> because that's what the, that's what it yeah. says it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the one SS is cloth. The two SS is leather with HUD and no okay. whole bunch of other stuff. Okay. Like that, so. Gotcha. And the. Content's pretty much the same between the LT and the LS at the, at the levels. It's just the engine that's the, the difference mm -hmm. between the LT and the SS. And, well, that's and kind the, of right. reason the issue about how you know selling cars, you, uh, you you're trying to do uh, what the Japanese did, obviously, and make it a little simpler. Oh yeah. By by having them fit in the packages, mm -hmm. but the Japanese, you know, Honda and Toyota especially, went to an extreme where you just go in and you just have a few combinations, and now you've got. Um, uh, the German manufacturers, especially, kind of pushing, uh, pushing uh, customization or, or yeah. a personalization, and especially in Europe where they build the cars and you buy the cars and you wait six weeks or eight weeks to get the car. But, you know, Toyota and Honda have put a lot of buyers in the habit of just going to a dealership, driving away in the new car the same day they walk in. Yeah. I, I kind of wonder what's best. I mean, you know, the, the old way of doing things in the state was, states was well, go out and check them all off, and that gonna, makes it special. Another one of the things I had fun working on was planning Saturn. Yeah. I started Saturn in 1985, and I, I had the distribution system and, and packaging, and, and uh, I was working with the guys doing the production system and everything. How should we do it and all this other stuff? and. Went and listened to them all day. This Alan Paradin came from Numi. Here's how Toyota does it. In 18 weeks of frozen schedules, yada yada yada. And I said, well, we haven't decided if we, if we own the dealerships yet or not. But if we did, we'd probably own the inventory, and that would outweigh the investment you're making in any of this little piddly ass stuff down in Spring Hill. <laughs> okay. Right. And I said, so, but let me show you some some data. And this was back in the middle 80s, where it was still back, you know. Pretty much custom order, yeah. and said, uh, "Okay, what percentage of the people quote go in and order their cars? Say they order their cars for Dodge, Ford, and Chrysler. It was twenty percent, okay, mm -hmm. which was the rule of thumb, right? right? Still is, I thought. That's yeah, a lot less now because of the mm. thirty-day incentives and, and okay. all that other stuff. Yeah. But mm -hmm. guess what it was for Honda and Toyota? People who order their cars, yeah, two or five percent or something. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Really? really? Remember the question was, did you order your car as a uh -huh. customer? And yeah. they said, yes, I ordered my car. 
what the answer was. The dealer didn't have what I wanted, so I told him what I wanted, and he went. And so then the question. He went was, to other dealers. He didn't. Or he called didn't. up the district manager, said, "Where can I find a blue one? Right. The sunroof, right? right?" And and then it's, so the next question was to those customers who ordered it. How long did it take? Dodge, Ford, and Chrysler, six to eight weeks, right? Right. Honda, Toyota, less than two weeks. Yeah. Cust but in the customer's mind, I ordered the car, I got it in two weeks. Okay. So, uh, so it's really lots of customers driving it. And today with the internet, it's like they go shopping on the internet and they come in. This is what I want. Well, all the configurators. Yeah. yeah. So and they come in and they come, and if you got eight gazillion different combinations, the the probability that I could probably win a lot more lotto is zero. Yeah. That that they'd actually have the car. So then you're in the, you're automatically put in a position with a customer of well, let me show you this, and let me show you that. And so do you think you, you might shift a little bit the other well, way? The, the, number, the 2012 Malibu, uh, other than color, the yeah. dealer can order it 10 different ways. Mm -hmm. That's it. I would see where you would, you'd want to do that for something like the Malibu, where, where the customer would go in and get his or her car, mm -hmm. uh, if not today, in a week or two. But what about something like the Camaro, where you want that person to sit down and check it off and say, I want these, uh, this odd stripe combination with the paint. Well, we do have the, the stripes and yeah. a lot of different things. Uh, yeah. and, and Corvette is even more yeah, so. Exactly. But there's still efforts. Well, it's all in price fact, we're looking too. At, at saying, hey, here's the kind of cars you can order for stock, Mr. Dealer. Mm -hmm. And then if a customer does want to order it, we can maybe build it differently. But Right, because the, the dealer is not going to want to get too outlandish right. with the color combos, for example. So. Yeah. But, you know, to your point, Todd, you know, BMW especially has a zillion different ways that yeah. you can do things. And they will happily charge you oh, of course. to have you them build it that way for you. Porsche is the same. Whereas when you're in a, a mass market like a Malibu, yeah. I mean, it makes a huge impact in the manufacturing area when you have a zillion different build combinations. And so not only does it hurt your cost, it also can hurt quality big time. Mm -hmm. And oh, that's yeah. the big that's reason true. why the Japanese yeah. kept it. And it's it, it, remember, you know, up until even the 80s, the Japanese were installing air conditioning at port of entry. They weren't even okay. doing it in their right. own factories. Right. We, we would do, I would do runouts uh, of all the different combinations you could physically make of a car, and the, the printout of the double-folded thing would be this thick of you know the, how many lines, 80 lines on each piece of paper, and then you could you could define over 92% of them by the ones on the first page mm -hmm. that you ever built. Mm -hmm. But yet you've engineered now the ability to do any one of those in the rest, wiring harnesses, you know, tests, everything, and then even it's like you said, cost. Sometimes you buy stuff and you end up throwing it away. Right. You know, because it's, it's cheaper to buy X amount than it is to buy. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the way that we build cars now, I can absolutely guarantee you these cars get built and they get shipped all over the country. And I can guarantee you that the vast, vast, vast majority of them, I mean like 90 percent, are not going to the point of optimum demand. Hmm. They're just going out there. And so, you know, you got a, a car going to Texas that somebody in Connecticut is just dying to have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But because of the distribution network, yeah. it mm -hmm. just doesn't go to the point of optimum demand. Yeah. And so you got to discount it or whatever, or, you know, connect with dealer to dealer to get it shipped, which adds it's to cost. And an interesting thing. We, uh, we have a lot of uh, folks who like to help us with that in uh, legislatures and uh, other things, too. So we, oh, I know. we have to be able to say it's fair and equitable. But, you know, to your point, there was a guy at Ford who did a real interesting study that showed, to, to your point, that 80 percent of everything they build, yeah. you know, people will just go and buy it. Yeah. And it's that 20 percent. And so his idea was... You, you just build that 80% and ship them out wherever, and now you reserve the 20% for build to order. Yeah. And so you, and, and that, that's how you handle build to but, order, but is even, only with 10, 20%. Have, especially today, you still have to limit what you actually do because um, I can't, for example, this is more theoretical, but we can say, okay, put those 21 inch wheels on a Camaro on the, that are on the 8 on the 6. Well, Maybe you can, maybe you can't, okay? And it might be because, hey, look, we haven't tested, you know, how well that, and it gets into the integration of the engine and the body control module, yeah. all that other stuff. So it's, uh, you could end up having to write all new software code for a car just by changing oh the wheel on it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, uh, so, hey, this has been great. Whoops. Rush. Rush. Thanks. <laughs> not, not rush. Thanks. <laughs> no, no, not rush. Yeah. So.
thank you. I hope it worked out well. Yeah. yeah. No, this is not good. It was fun? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like this warm man a lot. Yeah.